Hi again, everyone. This is Professor Casey. Today we're discussing the second half of Chapter 5, finishing out our talk about the American Revolution and everything that goes in with that. So now we're discussing the events uh, going forward from 1777, after the British uh, have uh, lost the Battle of Saratoga, and the French have agreed to come to the aid of the colonists. Okay. So this is a, a major turning point in the war, and ends up um, spelling a, a pretty sound defeat for the British over time. Okay. We'll, we'll start to see how their strategies uh, end up really failing from this point going forward. Now, the winter of 1777 to 78 is an extremely cold and bitter one, okay? made all the more uh, evident by the fact that the Continental Army has um, dwindled in terms of its numbers, in terms of supplies, and as we talked about in the last half, uh, this is really turning into a war of attrition. Okay? It's a war where people are trying to basically keep their supplies and prevent themselves from losing. Okay? So preventing losing supplies, people, and battles in general. Okay? Um, we have 7,000 soldiers in the Continental Army that are ill by February of 1778 from several different things. Okay? Uh, mostly from, um, you know, uh, from smallpox, from a few different fevers and so forth, from dysentery. And so it's a difficult um, situation now. Okay? The soldiers who are still staying in the army are often too sick to fight. Okay? And if winter uh, finishes, spring comes, and they're still unable to, to really pull it together, they're going to really have a difficult time. Um, so at Valley Forge is really where we're, where we're talking about now. Okay? This is after the Battle of uh, Saratoga has happened up in the north. Um, American forces under Washington now down in New Jersey have had to kind of hunker down at Valley Forge uh, after uh, defeating um, the, the Hessians in, in Trenton and Princeton. Okay. And they have to essentially build their own shelter from scratch, okay? because Valley Forge really doesn't have any, um, you know, any standing uh, structures of its own. Okay? So they have to build uh, wood and mud cabins to try to keep the cold out. Uh, many of the soldiers end up without shoes or without blankets here too, so this really compounds the issue even more. Um, many of them end up uh, having frostbite, they lose toes, they lose fingers. Um, 2,500 soldiers end up dying in the long term. Okay? 1,000 of them end up deserting. Um, and of course, uh, this is a, a time of starvation and hardship. So a lot of the soldiers end up uh, killing and eating the horses after they are unable to you know, find food elsewhere. So it's an extremely horrible situation. Things get bad at one point to where 50 officers end up resigning in the same day from the army. Okay, so this, uh, it's, it looks like this may actually be a capitulation for the most part. The, the Continental Army might be on its last legs here. Um, the only way that starvation is actually curtailed is um, the IOU system. Okay, um, people have to actually go to surrounding farms and take livestock and provide an IOU and say, look, our soldiers are starving. Uh, we have no way of feeding ourselves. This is our only way to survive. And amazingly, by March of 1778, the troops that are left end up recovering, okay, and Washington begins training them. Uh, he brings in Friedrich Wilhelm von Steuben, okay, who's a Prussian mercenary. He drills all of Washington's men on how to become effective um, soldiers, okay, and uh, Prussia is uh, uh, an entity that doesn't exist in the modern era anymore. It's a something that kind of went out in the, um, uh, the the late 19th century, early 20th century. Prussia used to be an area in what is modern day uh, Germany consisting of uh, one or two corners of some of the uh, central European states that exist today, or nations that exist today, I should say. Um, and we have Gilbert du Motier, the Marquis de Lafayette as well. Okay? He's a, a wealthy Frenchman who is so inspired by the um, by the colonists' cause that he volunteers himself to join the Continental Army and uh, and fight alongside the Americans. Okay, so he's a uh, very <laughs> eager character in the midst of all this, and he's a very uh, influential fellow. Okay, so for him to actually step down from wealth and to actually put himself in the midst of uh, something like this that is actually pretty um, pretty heavy in the hardship uh, range is a you know a pretty remarkable thing. 
When the British ended up withdrawing from Pennsylvania to New York in the spring in 1778, the Americans finally packed up and decided they're going to follow. Now in the West, things are a little bit different, okay? Because we still have a, a long stretch of frontier uh, in what used to be the border between the, uh, the British colonies and French territory, okay? And this is the area that was uh, so heavily disputed, uh, very heavy in, uh, in native presence as well uh, during the midst of the um, French and Indian War, okay? So since the Treaty of Paris, it has still become a very highly contested area so now we have not only British soldiers fighting the colonists, now we have more native presence here too. Um, and the British began to offer bounties uh, to the natives and even to loyalists for scalps of patriots. Okay, the British are kind of cashing in on this stereotype of the natives being um, savages, okay, and that they will actually end up scalping people. Okay, so again, this is a little bit more of a um, a European um, continuance of something that uh, that shouldn't have been continued. <laughs> Uh, George Rogers Clark is the leader of the colonial militia in the Kentucky Territory, yeah. uh, and Clark and 175 of his frontiersmen uh, capture uh, Kaskaskia, Cahokia, and Vincennes in the Illinois and Indiana Territory on July 4th of 1778, okay, so on the second anniversary of the Declaration. Uh, General John Sullivan uh, sent by Washington with about 4,000 troops to destroy 40 different native villages, ending the Iroquois Confederacy. Okay. So Washington is actually directly attacking native villages here as well as, um, as, well as the British, okay, because he knows that the, the natives are siding with the British in many cases. Okay. So it leads to um, more, uh, more bloodshed than should have happened in, in, in the course of the native involvement. Daniel Boone is an, uh, an individual who's gained quite a bit of notoriety in, in American history. Uh, he ends up holding off an assault of over 400 natives at, uh, at Boonesboro, Kentucky. And Boonesboro is, of course, named for, for Boone. He actually is a, uh, a very uh, accomplished frontiersman himself uh, and is in many ways considered kind of a precursor to the Davy Crockett mountain man uh, stereotype. And we also have Andrew Pickens. Okay? He's a military leader or a mil militia leader from South Carolina. Uh, ends up going on a rampage and burning several Cherokee villages uh, in retaliation for raids against white settlements in 1776. Okay? So there's a lot of back and forth uh, atrocities that end up occurring between the colonists and the natives in the South and in the West. All right, so in late 1778, the British decide that they are going to change their strategy yet again and expand the war into the South. Okay? And the reason they do this is because the Southern colonists are the ones who, uh, for the most part, have remained loyal to the British cause here. Okay? They have uh, stood to gain the most from British imports and exports. Okay? They, this is where most of the money is accrued, is in the South. Um, and so it seems like this would be a prime place to go and begin recruiting. So Sir Henry Clinton becomes the British commander-in-chief in America, and he sends 3,000 redcoats, Hessians, and loyalists to take Savannah, Georgia in December of 1778. And he also manages to recruit uh, the support of, um, of the Cherokee in the process. Okay, so um, Chief Dragging Canoe, who you see here, uh, promises that he is going to leave the ground dark and bloody with the blood of colonists. And this is initially an effective thing, but it ends up failing over the course of the next several months for a few different reasons. Okay. Um, for one thing, there are actually very much fewer colonists who are loyal to the British cause than the British think. Okay? Uh, the British kind of overestimate their influence here. Um, and any time that the British decide to try to push the natives into the mix and get them to attack settlements, uh, this, in many cases, causes loyalists to change their opinion of the British right? and end up uh, creating more Whigs, more patriots in the midst of all this than anything else. Um, and the British and loyalists uh, are, are cruel enough in, in the midst of all this, cruel enough to uh, other citizens, cruel enough to, or cruel enough to the, the patriots, cruel enough to the natives, uh, that it ends up causing a lot of defections. Okay? We actually have plenty of members of the British uh, army and members of the loyalist cause who realize that the British are willing to kill men, women, and children in many cases in order to get what they want. 
Enter Earl Charles Cornwallis, who becomes in charge of the British forces in the South. Okay. He ends up capturing Charleston and Camden in South Carolina and captures all of Georgia by 1780. So Cornwallis becomes a very central figure in the Southern campaign and ends up being the last holdout in, in the midst of all this and is uh, given kind of this uh, higher status in, in the midst of the revolution as a figure, leading figure in the British Army, simply because he is, um, again, one of the last holdouts, especially in the South. Now, one individual that uh, occasionally will get some attention in history books is a man named Francis Marion. Uh, he's an American officer who is given the nickname the Swamp Fox because he is well known for using guerrilla warfare against the British in the South. Okay? He will actually uh, hide and wait in the swamps he will uh, set traps, he will, um, you know, British soldiers will go into the swamp and they'll never come out again, okay? And so a lot of people begin to spread rumors that there are ghosts at work or that there's some supernatural thing. And in reality, it's Francis Marion and his men who are spiriting these people away, so to speak, right? Killing them, hiding the bodies, whatever the case may be, okay? So it's a, it's a good psychological scare tactic to use against the British. Thomas Sumner is a South Carolina mil militia general who is called the Carolina Gamecock. Okay? Gamecock because he's like a, a, a fighting rooster. Okay? He, uh, British end up burning his home and just about everything he owns, and so he feels like he has nothing to lose. By August of 1780, um, the entire South Carolina campaign has blown up in the British face. Okay? It, uh, they are now in a state of total rebellion against the British. Um, and so now families are actually uh, getting into divisions amongst themselves, okay? So you have uh, half of the family who might be loyal to the British crown and some that might be loyal to the American cause, okay? Um, this is very much uh, like what we see happen again in the Civil War and even on into the 20th century with uh, events like the Vietnam War, okay? Some people refer to this type of war as a living room war, okay? It was fought among members of a family. Um, Charles Lynch is a South Carolina judge here who actually gains a, a very infamous reputation and sets a, a rather horrible precedent for something that, uh, as, as terrible as, as it is, is still not considered a hate crime even today in, in America. Um, and his name gets transformed into the process we know as lynching. Okay? Uh, and he is actually a patriot who lynches loyalists. Uh, and lynching someone in this case is flogging them and then tar and feathering them, okay? And the process of tarring and feathering somebody is actually much more horrible than it sounds, okay? It's not necessarily just meant to be a way of uh, humiliating someone. It is also very, very painful and can kill people or disfigure them, okay? Um, the process of tarring and feathering someone, for instance, typically, again, occurs after they are flogged. Okay? So a person might be whipped on their back or whatever. Um, then the tar that is actually poured on them is boiling hot tar. Okay? So it will burn their skin. And not only that, but when the tar cools, it actually uh, adheres to the skin. Okay? So when the tar is peeled off of the skin, often it takes a layer or two of skin with it. Okay? So it's an extremely horrible aftermath to it. And then, of course, adding feathers to it, right, is, is just adding insult to injury. Um, and the British atrocities against the Patriots are at their harshest in the South. Okay? It seems like the, the area where the British are the most cruel um, and, uh, I mean, as, as inaccurate as it is, the, the Mel Gibson film, The Patriot, tries to uh, exemplify this a little bit, okay, when his, uh, when his farm is actually attacked and uh, one of his sons is killed. Uh, but the British are not above doing any of that. They're not above taking hostages, uh, burning homes, burning churches to the ground in some cases, uh, assaulting women and children. Again, this is, uh, it, it becomes um, uh, self-writing propaganda for the American cause. Okay? Uh, and the British are also not above torturing and killing prisoners either. Okay? Uh, one particular loyalist who is a victim of a lynching, just to give you a sense of, of just how far this can go, is a fellow named Thomas Brown, uh, he's nicknamed Thomas Burnfoot because he ends up surviving a lynching. He is beaten, he's scalped, uh, he is uh, tarred and feathered, and he's burned. Okay? And so this image that you see here of him is actually kind of a rare one. Um, he has to wear a facial prosthetic over, over part of his face. It looks like his nose was burned off, 
Uh, part of the skin on his forehead was uh, burned off, uh, and he had to wear a wig because, again, he's been scalped. His, his scalp is gone. So for an individual to actually survive this was a uh, a really um, horrific ordeal, okay? And again, it's it's life-changing for this to happen to somebody. Now, two more individuals who come into the mix here on the British side are Sir Benaster Tarleton and Major Patrick Ferguson. Okay? And these are two cavalry officers who are supposed to train the Loyalist militia. Okay? Uh, Tarleton uh, is the one for whom Tarleton State University is named, if you are a, a native Texan here. Okay. Um, in October of 1780, uh, Southern Patriot Militia ends up clashing with the Loyalists under Tarleton and Ferguson at Kings Mountain. Okay. And this is a, a, a ridge uh, across the North and South Carolina borders, and it's in the middle of a forest. Okay. So this is a, an especially dangerous place uh, for, for the soldiers to get into a fight. Okay. Uh, Ferguson gets killed in the process here, and 700 loyalists are captured, and 25 of them are hanged. Okay, so these are uh, people who might have been the neighbors or friends or even family members of some of the uh, American patriots fighting. Okay? And of course, anytime a battle like this can be fought in in a, a wooded area, these are flintlock guns. Okay, so if a, a spark catches a piece of dry grass or some sap or something, it can, it can set the whole forest on fire. Uh, in this particular fight, there are 74 sets of brothers who fight against one another and 29 father and son sets. So again, this is a, a very heavily divided region and the British are trying to make the most out of this uh, by, you know, um, you know, exploiting this, this weakness. Um, but the British are defeated here, and it's a very heavy setback for them because they have to retreat into South Carolina, and there's uh, virtually no Loyalist support thereafter. Okay, so um, South Carolina becomes kind of the last holdout uh, for the British presence, especially in the South, after they're defeated in the North. Now, the Battle of Cowpens is another battle that we can discuss here. This is uh, something that happens almost in the immediate aftermath of Kings Mountain. Um, Nathaniel Green, who is a former blacksmith, becomes the commander of American forces in the South. Um, and he ends up, uh, along with uh, General Daniel Morgan, um, pulling together their forces in South Carolina here against the British. Okay? Uh, Daniel Morgan ends up uh, going to Cornwallis's headquarters in Winsboro, South Carolina, uh, to try to treat with him to a certain extent. And, of course, it doesn't quite go the way that he expects. Uh, in January of 1781, Morgan decides he is going to petition or position his forces near Cowpens, uh, an area that's actually a cow pasture near Kings Mountain. Okay, uh, and so Tarleton's forces, once they leave the region around Kings Mountain, they come down into this open field and are suddenly surrounded by the colonists. Okay, uh, 110 British soldiers are killed, and over 700 of them, of them are taken prisoner. Okay, so this ends up being kind of like shooting fish in a barrel for the colonists. Tarleton, meanwhile, ends up escaping and eventually makes it back to England. Um, and it's supposed to be the most complete American victory of the entire war. Okay, this is one instance where um, the, the British don't really stand much of a chance because they've been lured into a trap. Now, by the time we get to 1780, the war uh, becomes something of endurance. Okay? This is, again, a, a war of attrition, and it's a war to basically outlast the other side. Okay? Um, and the Americans, at this point, thankfully have a territorial advantage, okay? because they actually they know the geography, they know where to hide, they know where to run, and the British, uh, in many cases, are not familiar with this. Okay? Um, that compounded with the fact that they, the British are actually, in many cases, especially in the South, uh, are fighting in a completely different type of environment than they're used to. Okay? Uh, if anybody has spent any time in the American South uh, during the, the, from March all the way up into October or November, you know that it gets blisteringly hot down here. So for a British soldier marching in a woolen uniform, uh, you can very easily succumb to heat stroke or any other, uh, any other problems. Um, when it comes to the Loyalists in the South, uh, their control is really limited only to Charleston, South Carolina, and Savannah, Georgia. And Charleston uh, becomes, uh, again, one of the last 
uh, holdouts and, and over the course of the war. Savannah does too, but uh, South Carolina in particular, again, kind of becomes where Cornwallis backs himself into a corner. In May of 1781, the British decide to invade Virginia. And Benedict Arnold here is finally bribed by the British to defect. Okay, so this is where we get the infamous, um, uh, you know, traitor situation with Benedict Arnold. Uh, Arnold also ends up uh, planning to sell out the fortress at West Point. Okay, this is his former command. Okay, and West Point, again, ironically, is the uh, the center of um, you know uh, the the army school. Right, this is the the army um, you know training ground here in America. Um, and eventually Arnold is uh, exposed by a captured British spy named Major John Andre, and the Americans are so furious with what Arnold has done that they decide that they are going to hang Andre uh, in retaliation. They okay? basically say if they ever get their hands on Arnold again, uh, this is what's going to happen to him. Okay? And Arnold actually escapes to England uh, and leaves his wife behind, uh, and there's actually um, a, a letter, and for those of you who are in my class, I'll post it on the discussion board where he actually sends a letter to George Washington asking that his wife be treated fairly by the Continentals after he's gone, okay? so that she's not be uh, ridiculed or, or branded as a traitor or the wife of a traitor. So now entering into the final phase of all this, okay, uh, General Cornwallis's forces are now headquartered at Yorktown on the Virginia coast. Okay, So most of the forces have begun to abandon South Carolina, they've begun to abandon uh, Georgia and most of the southern colonies, and they've all kind of congealed around Yorktown now. And Yorktown is a pretty strategically sound place for the most part. Okay, the British are able to uh, kind of hole up there. They can, uh, you know, fend off an attack from the colonists by land because they've got an entire blockade of British ships behind them. Okay, so if the Americans try to attack Yorktown from the land, um, they will have cannons firing at them as well. What the British don't expect, though, is that um, in the midst of all this, the colonists have sent Benjamin Franklin to um, to France to actually treat with the French. Uh, we've gone through the Treaty of Amity and Commerce already, and now the French have arrived at the 11th hour, so to speak. They land at Newport, Rhode Island in July of 1780. Uh, they're very briefly bottlenecked by the British okay, because the British forces are there and they don't really expect them. And then on August 30th, French arrive at Yorktown with 24 warships. Okay, and so now the British are socked in from two different sides. Okay, the Americans are on land, chasing them to the ocean, and the French are at sea, chasing them on land. Okay, and so now Cornwallis is blockaded from two different sides. Okay, and the British Navy are completely chased off by the French here. American and French forces are ferried from New York into Yorktown. 19,000 men are involved here. This is about twice as many as Cornwallis has. And on October 17th, Cornwallis finally surrenders after a three-week siege. Uh, he realizes that he doesn't have, uh, doesn't stand a fighting chance here. Uh, in December, George III finally decides that this war is too much of a financial drain on England. Uh, and he chooses not to send any more British troops to America. By February of 1782, Parliament finally votes to begin negotiations to end the war in favor of a new war with France and with Spain. Okay, so we end up, uh, the British kind of end up getting distracted from the American Revolution into something else. Now again, we have a whole new Treaty of Paris. Okay, the first one happened in 1763, and now we have another one here about 20 years later. Okay. Here the Continental Congress designates a very small detachment to go to Paris and discuss terms for the British surrender. They send John Adams, John Jay, who eventually becomes the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and Benjamin Franklin. Now, the negotiations go for several months, okay, so this lasts all the way until September 3rd of 1783. And on 1783, Great Britain finally recognizes the independence of the former 13 colonies as a brand new nation for the first time. And they agree that the Mississippi River is going to be the western boundary of America, at least for now. Okay? And you can see here the boundaries on the map on the left side from 1775 when the war begins, and in 1783 when the war ends, okay? 
So all of the yellow territory is British territory. All the purple is Spanish territory. Okay. Um, once the war ends, right, we have this little pink area on the eastern seaboard going all the way down to Florida and all the way across the Appalachian Mountains to the Mississippi River. Okay. And this becomes the new boundaries of America. Uh, and American territory now consists of over 900,000 square miles. Um, and one of the things that the Americans actually agreed to do, which they, uh, they might not have been obligated to do, but they did anyway, is they promised to honor all pre-war debts to British merchants. Okay? And, and one way this ends up with the Americans kind of shooting themselves in the foot, um, because in doing this, they basically are agreeing to pay back all of the damages done by the Boston Tea Party, by any and all protests and uh, damaging British goods and that sort of thing, okay? Anything that is owed to British merchants is gonna be paid back in full. But this war has cost so much in terms of not only human lives, but also economically speaking, that um, the country and its new state is not really in the position to pay anybody anything, okay? Now, once this revolution ends, right, we actually have a brand new precedent that's been set here in terms of how traditional governments are run and how social division is approached. Okay? Because again, this is going to be the very first active democracy in the modern world. Okay? All other nations everywhere else are typically monarchies. Um, the uh, Americans end up adopting what they refer to as a Republican ideology. Okay? This, this is a democracy where specifically, I have to put this in really specific terms here, property holding white men govern themselves through elected representatives. Again, this is um, the, the specific language that these men at the time had to understand. Okay? Again, they're, they're not really thinking so much in the long term. Okay? They're not expecting um, social divisions to shrink. They're not expecting um, the, the emancipation of slaves at any point. They're not expecting a lot of the social changes that we see all the way to the present, okay? And again, not defending them by any sense of the imagination here. Um, but in their minds, the only individuals who are going to be part of the governing system are property holding European descendants. Um, and the entire system of democracy is supposed to uh, entail full transparency. Okay? This is supposed to be one of the biggest benefits of it in that you don't have one individual making all the decisions all the time like the king. Uh, state governments are supposed to exist to protect individual rights and to prevent them from being violated by the national government. Okay? So we're going to have a separation between state governments and a national government. Um, and of course, things that are often included in state governments include uh, governors and senates that are elected by a popular vote, uh, local bills of rights in states that have to do with freedom of speech, trial by jury, freedom from self-incrimination, and so forth. Uh, there are limitations to a governor's power, and there are strength in legislatures to keep him in check. Okay. So all these are still um, common features of state governments that we see today in the U.S. Now, the Articles of Confederation is the precursor to what we know as the uh, the Constitution. Okay, this is the uh, this is the thing that legalizes this emergency government that's been operating in the colonies since the Declaration was signed in 1776. Okay, so the Confederation government uh, was kind of this ramshackle um, system of government that was kind of operating by you know chewing gum and duct tape up until this point, and now this is what legalizes it and takes it to the next step. Now Congress is given full power in foreign affairs and interstate disputes. And again, Congress at this point is the Continental Congress, the Confederation Congress. There are still no national courts, no power to enforce any kind of resolutions or ordinances. Okay, so we're kind of in the midst of a power vacuum a little bit. And unfortunately, there is no authority to levy taxes or regulate commerce in any way either. Okay, so all of the expenses that have gone into the war and all of the um, uh, all the moving parts of it and everything, there's no system to, to rebuild any of that. Okay? Not yet, anyway. Um, and again, this is kind of a volunteer-based thing in terms of financial contribution. Okay? Um, there, there's expectant uh, 
you know, expectancy for uh, unanimous support from nine different states when it comes to major decisions, okay? So anything to do with war, uh, treaties, uh, minting coins, or, or any finances, uh, article amendments, taxes, you name it, okay? This is all supposed to be a unanimous decision. And again, these are still colonies that have very different uh, ideologies, very different demographics, and um, very different desires from one another. Okay, so it's very different and very difficult for them to come to a consensus on anything. And the big fear here, and something that continues to go forward even for the better part of 100 years or more after this, uh, is that there is going to be an overpowering national government that is going to limit the strength of state governments. Okay? And that becomes, a um, again, an issue from the very get-go, and it's something that um, is in a certain way, not, not exactly this way in a certain way is um, looked at as being one of the causes in the Civil War. And one element of the revolution that doesn't really gain a whole lot of attention is the immediate aftermath and the social fallout from it. Okay? Because um, just because Americans end up winning the war and the British army eventually ends up leaving, it doesn't mean that everybody who stays behind in America is really happy with the results. Um, there is still a large loyalist contingency that lives in the Americas, and most of them are targeted for persecution by um, the new Americans, okay, new American citizens. Um, so in many instances, they are uh, targeted for property confiscation. Many of them are assaulted. Some of them are even executed because they have funded the British war effort, um, because they've sent supplies, because they have spied for the British. Um, so this is a, a really, really bad situation where if you are a loyalist to the British crown, you're essentially, um, you're a sitting duck, okay? you, you've been on the losing side. And so anytime there are lands uh, or property that is confiscated from loyalists, it provides opportunities for patriots now. Okay, so a lot of times this, these lands are confiscated and given over to individuals who have been a large part of the war effort. Uh, soldiers are, sometimes they are given certain tracts of land. And suddenly we have this massive exodus of loyalists, natives, and runaway slaves that are going to England. Okay? Native Americans are even packing up and leaving okay? because they realize they've been on the losing side and they could very easily be targeted for death. It's estimated that about 80,000 refugees end up leaving the colonies after this, and that's a very massive number uh, compared to how many people are actually there. Okay, there's only a, maybe a few million there. Okay, uh, most of them end up settling in Canada to try to displace the French a little bit, try to put a little bit more um, uh, of uh, British loyalism in Fran in New France, okay, in Canada. Uh, about 3,500 Black freedmen end up settling in Canada as well. And about 2,000 black freedmen end up fleeing to Sierra Leone and establish Freetown in Sierra Leone in Africa to, with actually um, British patronage, okay, backing them up financially. It's estimated, too, that about 12,000 loyalists from Georgia and South Carolina uh, end up actually going over uh, the border from British territory into Spanish territory uh, in, uh, in Florida with their slaves. Okay? Um, and only the slaves of patriots are freed by the British. Okay, that's another important thing. Okay? Um, the, the British actually don't free their own slaves. Okay? So it's a little bit of a, a crawfish on the deal here. Um, but when this happens, though, Spain ends up taking over Florida in 1783, and they begin to force the loyalists to convert from Anglicanism to Roman Catholicism or get out. <laughs> okay, so uh, in many cases, it's a out of the frying pan and into the fire situation for the loyalists. And because of this, several of them end up uh, going into the Caribbean. Okay, so you might have some who end up escaping uh, from South Carolina and Georgia over into Florida, and then they have to pack up and leave all over again and go into the Caribbean. Um, now that we have the separation of church and state in post-war America, um, many people are actually able to exercise a little bit more religious freedom, especially in terms of what denominations they can practice. Okay? Um, and this is really, uh, calling it religious freedom is really calling it denominational freedom more than anything. Um, religious freedom in a universal sense really is not a, a feature at this particular point in time. Again, there are still certain states and certain colonies that 
say that you cannot deny the divinity of Christ, that you have to practice a certain form of Christianity. Um, and, uh, you know, other religions like um, Judaism and even Islam don't even come in until much, much later. Okay. Um, the Anglican Church, too, is largely uh, a loyalist uh, entity. Okay? Again, it's the Church of England. Okay? So if you are a, a member of the Church of England and you are um, living in the colonies, right, uh, you might end up changing denominations over to the Episcopal Church. Okay? And the Episcopal Church is essentially the same type of liturgy, the same types of beliefs uh, as the Anglican Church. Um, in its modern form, the Anglican Church is a little bit more conservative than the Episcopal Church. Okay? Um, and, and the Episcopal Church is kind of the Americanized version of the Anglican Church, at least at this point in time. And by this point, too, the other thing is that all states began to eliminate tax support for churches. Okay? And this is something that um, has kind of been a sour point for anybody who is, uh, you know, a member of the clergy or, or anything else ever since, because uh, before this, remember, any kind of taxes that were uh, accrued in a certain region were actually given over directly to the church because the church was directly allied with the government. And now that there's a separation, um, there, there is no tax support. But at the same time, too, there are tax breaks for churches today, okay? which is, of course, a whole other controversy. So Thomas Jefferson in 1786 authors what he refers to as the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom. And this says that anyone in America can uh, have the assurance that there will forever be a wall of separation between the church and the state. Okay? And this actually originally comes from a, a letter that he gets from the Baptists of Danbury, Connecticut, who claim that they are being persecuted for their beliefs by the Congregationalists of the same area. Okay? And so he says that, um, you know, we're not going to uh, favor one denomination over another, uh, even, the, even though the Congregationalists were the ones who traditionally had the most authority in the region. Okay? So from this point forward, uh, no religion, no denomination is enforced or sponsored by the government, not in an official sense anyway. Amongst all the individuals who end up suffering in the aftermath of the war, the native tribes are the ones that catch the brunt of things. Um, they have their lands completely appropriated from them once again, okay? and most of them are driven completely westward uh, regardless of what side they take. Okay? If they side with the British, then many of them end up leaving the country altogether. If they side with the colonists, even then the colonists are not willing to grant them their land back in many cases. So it a, begins a string of broken promises to Native Americans going well into the modern period. Now, when it comes to the institution of slavery at this point, uh, again, the most ironic aspect of all this is that the British offer more freedom for slaves than the Americans do in terms of incentive. Um, in November of 1775, the Virginia royal governor offers freedom to any slave who becomes a Tory. And remember, a Tory is a loyalist to the British crown. And it's estimated that around 3,000 end up joining the loyalist cause as a direct result of this promise. Okay. Um, again, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson are both slave owners, and both of them lose slaves to the British ranks. Okay. So it's a, uh, um, you know, there's, there's no irony lost here. 23 of Jefferson's slaves end up escaping. Uh, six of them are actually recaptured, and Jefferson actually sells them for quote unquote disloyalty. Okay, so, uh, you know, it's, and it's an impossible thing to expect anybody to side with the American cause when they're willing to allow this to continue. Okay, so if you are in the position of a slave at this point in time, you're being offered freedom by the enemy, but you're being forced to stay in bondage in this under your you know, your current auspices, um, what side are you going to pick? Okay, so it's, you know, again, it's, it's cognitive dissonance at its worst here. Okay. And eventually Washington does authorize the enlistment of free black men into, um, into the colonial forces over time, okay? but uh, it's, it's more toward the end of the war. Georgia and South Carolina are the only two states to refuse to allow anyone in, uh, to allow any black, um, uh, volunteers. Okay, and again, Georgia and South Carolina, going into the 19th century, and especially once we get to the Civil War, are two of the primary uh, epicenters for uh, the slave trade. 
Massachusetts and Rhode Island, meanwhile, organize all black army units. Okay, so this is a, uh, it's, it's, we're beginning to see the geographical differences between the North and the South in terms of how much um, influence slavery has. And the British primary strategy here is to arm all freed slaves. Okay, this is something that is uh, a tactic that is used time and time again uh, against Southerners um, by uh, all the way well up into the Civil War. It happens here, it happens in the War of 1812, and it happens in the Civil War. Um, because the, the Southerners, the biggest concern that they have from this point going forward is that slaves are one day going to realize that they are slaves, that they are um, you know, in a position where they could potentially gain their freedom if they have enough of an armed um, uprising. And so to arm recently freed slaves and to set them against the Southern population is to basically bring their own worst fears against them. Okay? It's, a, it's a nightmare scenario. Um, and this ends up uh, causing the, and it's poetic justice to a certain extent, uh, in the eyes of the British, if nothing else, okay, to, to say that, you know, a recently freed slave, this slave used to belong to this person, and now it's going, he's going back to his former owner to, you know, potentially kill him. British end up freeing approximately 20,000 slaves during the course of the war, uh, and several hundred thousand end up escaping in captivity just during the battles themselves, okay, several battles end up uh, you know, overflowing into local farmsteads, local plantations, uh, and in the midst of the chaos, it's very easy to slip away. And the northern states, in most cases, end slavery either during or right after the war just because of the ideas of liberty. Okay? Many people actually do walk the walk as well as talk the talk. Okay? They don't just practice co cognitive dissonance like Washington and Jefferson. They actually do hold to the ideas that all men are created equal. Okay, so it's to the credit of those specific Americans that this is actually accomplished. Now, the role of women in the course of this war is another thing that doesn't really gain a whole lot of attention, especially in streamlined history classes. Um, Abigail Adams uh, is the wife of John Adams, right, who becomes our second president after Washington. Um, and she is one who actually is uh, very much a key member of kind of this first wave of feminism that occurs, especially in America, okay? Uh, she's a very strong and independent woman who ends up uh, saying that there needs to be female representation when it comes to the laws in America, okay? Uh, she actually tries her best to petition her husband uh, to put in, um, you know, certain elements into the Constitution and other areas to, to grant uh, certain rights to women that they haven't had before. Uh, she says, um, She's told in response that women should not, quote, wrinkle their foreheads with politics, but, quote, soothe and calm the minds of their husbands, unquote. Okay, so um, this is still very much a chauvinistic, uh, patriarchal society, okay, unfortunately. So um, women do, however, cover themselves with glory in many, many instances in the course of this war. Um, Molly Pitcher is a, a woman who is a, a kind of a semi-folkloric individual in the course of all this. Uh, she is uh, supposedly a uh, kind of this legendary figure that is inspired by true events by a, a woman named Mary Ludwig Hayes. Uh, she's a, supposed to have fought at the Battle of Monmouth in 1778. Uh, her husband was a, um, a cannon loader, and when he actually uh, was shot in the midst of loading the cannon, uh, she ended up dropping what she was doing and began loading and swabbing the cannon herself at Monmouth after her husband dies and firing the cannon herself. So, again, it's a very romantic uh, image here. Uh, again, partially based in truth, partially based in legend, but um, she's also responsible for carrying water and washing clothes at Valley Forge. We know that much for sure. Uh, and Molly is actually commended by Washington as a non-commissioned officer. She's called Sergeant Molly <laughs> thereafter. Uh, Emily Geiger is another individual. She's a civilian who was actually captured by the Tories. Uh, she's a, um, supposed to be spying for the, for the Americans here. And the, the message that she's given on a piece of paper, she ends up memorizing it. And when she actually is captured, um, she actually eats the message itself, the written message on a piece of paper, uh, eats it, swallows it, and then delivers the message orally after being freed by the Tories who don't suspect her that much because she's a woman. 
And then black women as well have a, a major role to play here, too. There's a, a, a woman who has the nickname of Mammy Kate. Uh, she was a, a, a black slave woman who smuggles her imprisoned master, Stephen Hurd, past the British guards in a linen basket perched on top of her head. Okay. Uh, and this was, uh, this is, a, I don't think this is an actual photograph of her, but it's a, of a woman who is carrying a basket in a similar manner. Okay. Um, and women during this time period, slave women who carry these baskets, uh, there, there's still societies in Africa that still do this as well. These baskets are massive and they weigh tons and tons of, you know, pounds and everything. And these women are somehow able to hold it on top of their heads like this. So for her to carry a full grown man in a basket on her head, uh, it's a pretty remarkable uh, feat in and of itself, but she's granted freedom for doing this okay, because she smuggled her master back, um, past enemy lines. And of course, as we know, July 4th is now celebrated as Independence Day. Okay? Uh, it could very easily have been moved to uh, a, a different date corresponding with the British recognition of the U.S., um, but, you know, us as Americans putting forth uh, a declaration of independence on this day is what really cements it in place. Uh, John Adams predicts that it's going to be a day of deliverance marked forever by celebration, parades, and fireworks, as it continues to be today. Um, the, the you know motivations for celebrating it have uh, obviously varied over the course of the last few centuries and even into the present day. Uh, in some cases, it, it feels like a celebration is not always worthwhile. Um, America, though, from this point forward, at least in the um, in the common imagination, is linked to ideas of freedom, uh, in some cases to divine providence. And again, this is something that is used as a very negative tool over time. Okay? When Americans begin to uh, bring the divine into it and say that they have been given you know, divine permission to take a certain part of land or, or something along those lines, spirals out of control very, very quickly. And we see this backfiring in many ways, especially as we get into the 19th century. Um, and the idea of a nation that is a contemporary creation um, is, is something that um, uh, America enjoys that other nations um, don't really share, okay? because most other nations at this point, again, are typically hereditary monarchies that have existed for several hundreds of years. Um, and America is one of the youngest countries still anywhere in the world today. Okay? Uh, it's supposed to be a country that embodies progress, uh, a bright future, and again, it's the only standing democracy, at least at this particular point in time, compared to a sea of monarchies. It embodies all the uh, ideas of the Enlightenment, for better or for worse. Um, and again, it doesn't have the dark past that a lot of uh, Western Europe does. Okay? Uh, so there's not you know, centuries of warfare, of, of massacres, and so forth. Not that we don't start our own massacres in the aftermath of this, but uh, it's, it gives America the potential for a bright start. And the other thing, too, is there is no common ethnic origin. Okay? Uh, countries like England and uh, other places in, in mainland Europe all have a, a very centralized and very homogenized population. Um, and you know, even with the advents of, of slavery, with the, the presence that we have with Native Americans, uh, with, with the Spanish coming in and so forth, uh, America gradually begins to take on um, very different shapes over time. Okay, We have different uh, ethnic groups that start to migrate to America beginning at this point. Um, and again, for better or for worse, for, the, for good motivations or for bad motivations, in many cases bad, uh, we have a, a brand new country that is, uh, again, supposed to be this idea of a, a melting pot or better yet a mosaic. And it's viewed as a new form of world leadership. Again, it's a, it's a brand new precedent that has been set by no other country before. 